Hello, hello, everybody. This is Gerald Salenti with Judge Andrew Napolitano. And there is no one in America, no place anywhere, nobody says what he says with the judicial and legal authority in talking about what's going on, what it means, what's next in the legal system, in the freedom and spirit of America, what has been stolen from us and what we have to do to get it back. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Doctor, Judge, Judge Doctor, <laughs> Andrew Napolitano, uh, thank you so much for being on. Thank with you, us today. I could use a doctor. I have a frog in my throat, but you got hopefully... a frog in your throat? Yeah. yeah, I got a tooth pulled yesterday. So yeah. <laughs> and, and here we are, you know, we do this because we're trying to help America in every way that we can. Right. And you and I were both speakers at Ron Paul's War on Us event this past Labor Day weekend. The War on Us. And we're fighting that war on us. You know, the judge has a cold. I got a mud on. The tooth thing is, woo. You know, it's going to take like eight months to fix this thing up, they say. After, but anyway. Oh, so know. the bone the bone has to grow in and then they have to put an artificial tooth yeah. in the bone. You anyway. know what? I hate to say this, and I hope the good Lord doesn't strike me down. The artificial teeth are better than the real ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Judge, you wrote an article uh, that just came out. What happens when the government breaks its own laws? And it begins by saying Americans live under a government regime, perfectly said regime, which openly breaks its own law. The government not only believes it can do whatever it can get away with politically, not only believes that it can torture its foreign foes and claims the torture is a state secret, not only can bribe and coerce witnesses into saying what the government wants to hear, but it also can authorize criminals to commit crimes. What kind of country are we living in? I, I, I appreciate uh, you're addressing the article and what you read. And it's almost unimaginable that this is happening, but it's happening right before our eyes. Um, Mike Horowitz is the inspector general of the uh, FBI and has been a thorn in their side, excuse me, the inspector general of the Department of Justice and has been a thorn in the FBI side for years, recently came out with a report on the excesses of federal law enforcement. There's a lot in there about the DEA and the postal inspectors and all kinds of things. I just wanted to focus on the FBI because the numbers were so startling. So we learned that in an eight year period, the FBI paid $300 million to its informants in a four-year period of that, uh, within the eight, the FBI ordered its informant, authorized its informants to commit, you ready for this number? In four years, 22,500 crimes, federal and state. Now that implicates federalism because basically the FBI is going to county and state prosecutors saying, this guy that just robbed this bank, you gotta let him go because he's working for us and we authorized him to do this. this. This is mind boggling that this is happening. And the numbers are so over the top, 300 million to coerce the informants to do what the FBI wants, 42 million a year to pay the expenses of the informants, and then allowing them to go back to their old criminal ways could not have happened without the personal knowledge and authorization of the directors of the FBI. So we're going back to the Jim Comey years, though candidly, most of this happened uh, under the Chris Ray years, who's uh, the present uh, director of, of the FBI. So most of these informants are themselves criminal defendants. Oh. And the FBI says, we'll talk the prosecutors into throwing the case against you out or reducing it if you can help us entrap so-and-so. Entrap so and so, yeah. Take a look at the so called plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan. She was in no more danger of being kidnapped than you and I are now. 
but the FBI hired 18 informants to entrap 12 of their buddies. Originally, all 30 of them were charged. Obviously, the charges against the informants were immediately dropped. The whole thing was a charade. That's what the FBI is doing with your tax dollars and with the authority that you have given to it. You know, no one is saying this, what you are saying. And, and this, everybody listening, you know, perk up to this. This is, no one's saying what you are saying about this. And, and that this is going on in what used to be called, you know, the land of the free, a country with a declaration and, uh, uh, of independence, a bill of rights and a constitution, that this kind of criminality is going on. This is, this is, we're talking, we're not talking, you use the word in the beginning over here, Americans live under a government regime. This isn't a government, this is a crime syndicate. Well, when the FBI can decide what laws will be broken and what laws will be enforced and who can break them and who will enforce them, then the FBI itself becomes the law. And that's one of the reasons we have a constitution is to prevent that from happening. I, I know I used a phrase in there that's a little whimsical, but it's true. It should be against the law to break the law. Unfortunately, it's not. It's not. And the dirty little secret, I can tell you this from my prior career on the bench, uh, Gerald, you and I have talked about this many times, but I don't know that we've uh, articulated it in public until now. The dirty little secret in law enforcement is, and this is known to politicians, public officials, lawyers, and judges, is that the government in some way breaks the law every single day and gets away with it. <laughs> and and the, pub, the public needs to know that. Now, look, I've worked with FBI agents. Some of them are selfless, terrific human beings, men and women. But we're talking about a small cadre of FBI agents that have taken this power and, and brought it into an area outside the Constitution. We're also talking about senior management that allows this to happen. And when you want to, we can go to what the FBI has been doing with respect to torture, which came out at the same time and which is also mind boggling. Yeah, you right here, you say that the FBI needs radical reforms or even dissolution. Well, why do we need an FBI? I mean, the whole idea of, of the uh, compact of the states forming a federal union is that things like health, safety, welfare, and morality would be dealt with by the states. The concept of a federal police department was totally alien to all of the founders. Even the big government ones like John Adams and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, would be, their hair would be curled at the thought of a federal uh, police department. And what have they done so great? You know, name me, name me what, they, what the FBI has accomplished that we should pay all this kind of money to them to do what they're doing. What have they, tell me the great things that they've accomplished. I can't, I can't answer that. Uh, you know, Hoover was a monster, but in the Hoover years, they dedicated themselves to crimes that took place across interstates, um, uh, interstate borders, to crimes that Congress had enacted to make it easier for the states to enforce laws. Since the George W. Bush years, they've become a, a domestic intelligence agency, stated differently, a domestic CIA spying on Americans to try and figure out in advance who's going to do what in this nonsense about setting up these crimes, swooping in and solving the crimes before the trigger is pulled, so to speak. The New York City subway uh, bombing, a bombing that never took place, a bombing where there never was a bomb, the whole thing was concocted by FBI agents. And of course, with cameras in tow, they just arrived the last minute where this creep thought he had a bomb. It was totally inert because the FBI had yeah. given it to them. Oh, we saved the New York City subway system. Bologna, you concocted the whole thing. The New York City subway system was never in danger, just like Governor Whitmer for all of her faults. She has a right to live. She was never in danger by this so-called plot to kidnap her. Why do we let the government get away with this? Again, you know, look what the government's doing to us now and robbing us of all our freedoms that we have. Well, oh, I, they, you I know, they just came out with an, uh, the, the Biden administration, more mandates, you know, to fight the COVID war. Right. And, you know, <laughs> I'm reading what they're doing and they're also requiring masks on... Um, 
uh, public transportation, air, airlines, until March 18th. Why well, I said that's a lot of baloney. How come it's not March 17th? Why not March 15th? I say March 19th. They can't. I come say up. you're making this crap up. They can't come up with a reason. If if um, if it is so important for workers to be vaccinated, why did they exclude all workers who work in an environment where there are 99 or fewer workers? Are they healthier than if there's 100 uh, or more workers? I mean, it's just insane the way they've uh, drawn that line. Yeah. And, and, I, I wanna, by, and by the ahead. way, I want to warn everybody, you know, the judge over here, we, you know, he... He told you he's drinking tea over there in his throat. This thing, this it's gonna get, it's gonna hit you. It's gonna go through the camera, in, into your home. It's gonna <laughs> knock you out. Oh, and maybe the FBI will come after you to do it because we're all seeing this. We're right here. He's coughing. He's not well, and we're all gonna get sick and die. Therefore, I mean, we well, better, let's make up any we, crap we want. Therefore, we better lock him up. Yeah, I mean, that's the logic. That's, That's the logic. logic. And of course, this crazy new uh, strain and your piece on what you can do with the letters in that strain, how the name of the strain also spells the word moronic. That was brilliant in your Trends Journal uh, this week. Turns out this thing is l less, they believe, less severe than the cold that I have now. This is yeah. going to trigger lockdowns and mask requirements and social distancing, just like we all went through 18 months ago because the government loves to assert its power over the rest of us. And that's what this article is about. Look how they have controlled our lives. Why aren't the people fighting back? I tell you, the streets are empty out here. There's, there's, at nine o'clock at night, it's dead. It's dead. There's no convention business, no tourism business, no, no, no trade shows. And this is global. This is going on globally. And well, now the it's town, this new fear. The town that you're talking about has wonderful restaurants. Oh, is it play, well, every, so many places are closed down and haven't opened up again. Wow. And again, what we're looking at, you mentioned about the, this new <laughs> virus, this moronic virus. And again, we quoted the health minister of South Africa, the woman, where, where they found it. The one, these are the people that found it. And her quote is that it's sore muscles, it lasts for a day or two, and it's it, what they're saying is it, it, they can't find it being that bad. And what are they doing? Look what happened to the equity markets on Ooh. Wednesday. Catastrophic. One case, not, not, not a death, one case was found in America. The markets collapsed. Out of 332 million people, you're telling me you got one case? Because Israel the closed knows. down. They were the first ones that went berserk. They had one confirmed case, two other suspected cases out of a country of nine million people. Oh, and they were all, all fully vaxxed. Gerald, all governments know their most effective weapon is a four-letter word, fear. Fear. Well, you and I have a lot of friends who are in the financial services industry. These are basically intelligent people that know how to invest other people's money. Look at the fear that struck them in the past 48 hours because of these very few sporadic cases. In some cases, 10,000 miles away, it was still enough to tank the uh, stock market. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And going back to the people that we know and the insiders, do you know that in the last year they've they've sold about seventy billion dollars worth of stocks? So they see where this is going, and this latest round of fear that they're spreading. And you said it, uh, fear is is the control element, and it's happening and it, and it's taking over. And if we don't change this around, we're going to be in some very very difficult times. But your article here about what happens when the government breaks its own laws? This is something that everybody should really uh, uh, tune into and, and learn more about. By the way, where can they find this article? Well, they can get it at uh, lewrockwell.com or they can get it at judgenap.com. Judgenap.com. 
And, well, and jetsnap.com will also have all of my podcasts. There are some nice images of you on there as well. Oh, great. And, and what, what you're saying here is that to use the use of clean teams continued the government's desired public perception of the FBI as good guys and the CIA as bad guys. Explain this, what you're talking about. So uh, three weeks ago, for the first time in American history, <clears throat> a uh, criminal defendant was permitted to get on the witness stand and testify to the torture that was inflicted on him by the CIA. They tortured this guy periodically for two and a half years. And then the CIA said, he's telling the truth. What we, there's, he does not know what we thought he knew uh, and he's telling the truth and the torture uh, was useless. The government did not challenge that, but the government said, don't worry about it. We're not gonna put the torturers on the stand. We're gonna put a clean team on the stand. Uh -huh. What's a clean team? These are FBI agents who come in and interrogate the tortured detainee after the CIA is finished with him. And he basically tells them the same thing he told the CIA so that the FBI can get on the witness stand and on cross-examination answer truthfully. You know, we didn't torture him. We just uh, interviewed him and we don't know what happened before we got there. Well, that is the case except when an FBI agent becomes a CIA agent. What? Yes. So we also learned last week that for the second time in American history and with the approval of the president of the United States, George W. Bush at the time, in 2002 and 2003, nine FBI agents left the FBI for a year and became CIA agents ah. so that they could engage in the torture and the, the, the bad rap that the CIA gets would stay away from the FBI. And then after the torture was over with, they went back to their jobs as FBI agents. I mean, this is a head scratcher like you couldn't believe. Does it matter if the torturer is a real CIA agent or a permanent CIA agent? Of course not. It only matters to the government. Torture has been criminal since the World War II era. It has been universally outlawed in three treaties to which the United States is a party, but the government doesn't care. It will do what it can get away with politically. And get away with politically, how about get away with morally? The government doesn't care for uh, care about morals. It will claim that it does. But when you look at what it's been doing, paying people to break the law, engaging in torture, changing jobs so that you can get away with the torture, but still torturing nevertheless, does the government care about right and wrong? You know, the word government, again, it, I think we have to narrow it down. You know, the word government makes it seem like it's just a, this thing out there. But it's bigger than that. I mean, it's to the individual. It's not a, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it, it, by, by saying government, it, it takes the responsibility away from the criminals that are creating, that are destroying our, our, our country. You know, even, even you and me who have spent our careers monitoring this stuff, products of the public school education system occasionally fall for the use of the word government rather than the people that are actually in it. Government, the word government has sort of an aura, a respect to it. Government is the negation of liberty. Government is the monopoly of force in a geographic area. Government doesn't care about right or wrong. It just cares about staying in power. These are truisms, Gerald. These are not political statements. You write on here, you say, what happens when the government breaks its own laws? It should be against the law to break laws. Unfortunately, it is not. A dirty little secret known to politicians, public office holders, lawyers, and judges is that the government and its collaborators break the law every day with impunity. You know, what you're saying, Judge Napolitano, there is no, no, no authority 
like you in America that knows these facts, that knows the law, that is making it as clear as you are to the American people and what you're doing to help, there's no one that comes close to this. Why aren't others out there in your profession doing what you're doing, fighting for freedom? And again, as I'm talking, I also understand, as you keep saying about what government is, what the Constitution means, and on and on, there aren't people that know that and put it together in the legal aspect. You know, all this uh, material in my article, and the material is my interpretation of the facts, but the facts were laid out by Inspector General Horowitz. You didn't see this on the front page of the New York Times or, or in any of the media. I learned about it because someone who agrees with you and me sent me an email. I thought they were exaggerating a little bit, but I, I read what they sent, and then I went to the Inspector General's report, and it's all there. They did spend $300 million dollars in eight years to uh, to bribe informants. They did spend $42 million a year on the informants. They did authorize the informants c- to commit 22,500 crimes. They did leave the FBI for a year and a half to become CIA agents. This stuff happened, and the American public should know it and do something about it, or it will happen again, and it will happen to you. And again, this is not news. It's nowhere. It's nowhere. I never heard this. Oh, but did you hear about that tennis player, that Chinese woman? Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of crap I got to hear. You know, th- th- this is, this is, but, you know, the other side of this is that the vast majority of the people don't care. Uh, I think you're right. In, in hard times, whether it's fear of a, a pandemic or whether it's fear of inflation, people prefer safety to freedom. They don't care about this. They would say, I don't care what the FBI does as long as it keeps me safe. They're not knocking down my door. They're not torturing my kids. I think that's a common attitude. You know, I have to say, you know, this is, this is like, I think we're seeing, we are seeing the decline of America in a way that, that's going down in, 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 in speed and direction and downwardness that I don't think anybody could have ever, ever forecast. In, in, in the total Well, you've been forecasting it for years. I but mean, not you, like, you, not what, what's going on now, the immorality right in front of our eyes. But again, you're right, it's been going on for years. And what, what can we do to stop this? What, 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 what can we do? What can we do? You know, there are great people out there, Congressman Thomas Massey of yep. Kentucky, uh, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. They are vastly outnumbered. They know what's going on. They go to the floor of the House uh, and, uh, and reveal this, and, and the Senate, and reveal this stuff. But for the most part, the culture of government is to get along and go along, and you'll get ahead. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what can we do? What can we tell the people listening? What can they do? Well, they can be aware of this stuff. They can talk about it. They can challenge members of Congress. There are some very uh, courageous members of Congress who from time to time will burst out of the shells that the Republican and Democratic leadership like to keep them in and will pound away on certain areas like this. Senator uh, Chuck Grassley, who was in his 80s, uh, of um, uh, Iowa, has been a fierce opponent of the FBI for years. I probably should send him this column and you'll hear him ranting and raving about it. Uh, they should interrogate Chris Ray, the director of the FBI, under oath in public and on television and compel him to justify uh, this behavior from a constitutional and a moral perspective. You know, maybe the next political party should be called the Constitutionalists. <laughs> well, neither of the major political parties uh, believes in uh, complying with the restraints on the Constitution it, they really are two wings of one oh, big government that. party. Their principal goal is to stay in power. They both like war. They both like taxes. They both like uh, deficit spending. And they enact laws to make it easier for them to stay in power. But I'm saying, what about a new party? And they call it the Constitutionalists. That's what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Judge. Hope you feel better soon. And anybody that got the uh, cold from Judge Napolitano, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's his fault. He came on the air. It went right through the air. It zoomed. It zoomed I'm, I'm into drinking, you. I'm drinking very fine Irish tea, Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judge. See you next week. All the best, my friend.